for conviction. Um, a couple years ago, Bill de Blasio's administration came out saying that we were going to um, close Rikers Island and transition to a borough-based jail system. So there would be one jail per borough, except Staten Island. Um, and the combined maximum capacity would be 3,300. So we're a little far off of that. <clears throat> um, and here is a snapshot of just what has been going on at a daily level for the jail population from 2019 to current day. You see um, in early 2019 to 2020, we're doing a good job at decreasing the jail population. However, COVID-19 really screwed that up for us. Um, there was a lot of case backlogs in the court system, um, an increase in crime um, after like 2021. And now with the Adams administrations, we're continuing to see the jail population increase. So that's not looking good. Um, I decided to use open source data for this project. Um, the New York City Open Data Portal has three um, interesting data sets that DOC publishes. One is a daily inmates in custody, which gives you basically a real-time snapshot of who is under DOC custody. However, I can't use this as ideal as it would be because it's not historical. So it changes every day and there's no log of what happened the day before, years before. So we needed to do a workaround and we used the historical um, admissions and discharge tables. Um, which is a little bit less than ideal, but it gave us historical data dating back to 2014. Um, and so this top workflow is what I would have done if I had the daily inmate um, in custody historical table. So I would have aggregated to monthly and I would have created, that would have been my dependent variable or my time series. And then I would have just ran um, a pretty simple ARIMA model. Um, and I was going to forecast 12 months into the future would have been very nice, a very clean data science project. However, that is not the case. So I had to get a little bit creative. So with the admissions and discharge data combined, I created this monthly jail population change dependent variable, which I then did a time series analysis on and forecasting. Um, but then there's a second or there's a last step that I needed to do, which was like a simulation um, using the most recent month's average jail population. Um, and I'll talk about that in a couple slides. So here you'll see the monthly jail population changed, decomposed into its three parts. Um, the trend line, its seasonality. So here we see there's a very strong yearly seasonality corresponding to um, Christmas. They discharge a lot of people during the Christmas um, season. And then this last plot is just the residual errors. Um, Next, I trained, like I said, a classic ARIMA model, but because we had a really strong seasonal component, um, I did a seasonal um, ARIMA with 12 months um, of seasonality, and I trained my model on basically the de Blasio administration, so 2014 to 2021. I tested it on the Adams administration's timeline, so 2022 to present day, um, and then I forecasted 12 time steps in the future. But again, this is just the jail population change at a monthly level, not the actual jail population. Um, so what I had to do is here in this gray, you'll see this is like the confidence interval. So really, our model forecast says that with 95% confidence, it's going to fall anywhere in this gray region. So I created 12, here's 15, because this was a few months ago, um, distributions. So basically the likelihood um, of what the population change is gonna be month to month. Using the current population, basically just adding up the average here um, to get our final projection at the end. And we found that yes, as of September, 2027, our jail population is going to be upwards of 7,000, um, give or take about a thousand people. Um, this is significant because the Department of Corrections actually came out with a statement saying, that our jail population come September 2024 is going to be upward of 7,000, which is obviously the reverse direction that we wanna go if we wanna close Rikers um, and drastically decrease our jail population. Um, that being said, there's also a really small chance, my analysis found that there's gonna be a really small chance that we will see a smaller jail population come September um, than our current state, which is also really disheartening. I found that it was about 16.2% chance that that would be the case. Um, 
And so hopefully this analysis is going to help um, a bunch of different organizations in the city plan diversion tactics for certain groups of people on the island um, and just to try to pivot that borough-based jail system to become a more um, tangible plan in the future come 2027. Um, yeah, so that's my talk. Hopefully I made it under five minutes. Thank you so much, Lee. Next, we'll have uh, Lazarus. Hi, everyone. Uh, did you hear me fine? All right, when you go to the show, nice thing. Um, I think I just need the information to share. I think uh, I got a text message that I was a co host now, so I don't know if that was a mistake. Oh, thank you, Nala. I see it. Um, all right. Uh, could you see my slides? All right. Um, thank you so much. That was a really great presentation, you and I. So hopefully, mine is up to par. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Lasso Alvarez. I'm a solution engineer for a data consulting firm called Kokagia. And although my role is more IT ops focused, uh, where now I provide the cloud and maintain the cloud infrastructure for other R and Python users, um, I do have a data science background and I've been using R for over five years. Uh, I also want to thank the NYC R Wings organization for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. And um, this is a really um, a neat uh, service that I think goes really well with R projects. Um, hopefully, it can provide future uh, value to, the, to everyone that uses R here. So um, I'm talking about AWS S3 and using AWS S3 for your R projects. Um, Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3, is a super highly scalable, um, secure and durable cloud storage service uh, provided by AWS. Um, it's also very low cost as well, which makes it very um, one of the easiest services to use and one of the most efficient and cost efficient to use as well. Um, it allows individuals and organizations to store and retrieve data over the internet. So um, S3 also has this um, S3 buckets. And the best way to describe a bucket is just a folder in the cloud, uh, similar to, it could be uh, similar to like a OneDrive folder or maybe like a box drive, um, but it's it can be used to store files and data and really just think of buckets as you know, a folder or a directory um, where you can organize and store your data. Each bucket has a globally unique name within the S3 system. So your bucket that you create is always unique to, to there's only one of a kind or only one name that's available in the world. So how could you leverage R and S3 buckets? So if you want to use, because S3 is simple storage service and it can be leveraged in a variety of manners. So I have this really neat uh, uh, visual graphic that shows this bucket. It's an S3 bucket and you can use this to, you know, simply store your data files, your CSV, your exit files for your R projects. Um, you can also store data or maybe some JPEGs or some scripts for your Shiny apps as well. And then uh, you can also, if you have a Shiny app in production or if you have a Shiny app where you're, you want to collect data from users, uh, you can uh, have a log be written to an empty S3 button as well. So S3 is very flexible uh, and there's way more use cases than just this, but um, in the amount of time, you can, just because of the short amount of time, um, you can definitely use it to host data for your R project. You can host different types of files from uh, G, uh, JPEGs, um, um, R data files. Um, it can also be a place of outputs. And then one of the neat, one of the neatest features about S3 as well is that it has versions. So if you have different um, data files that live in your S3 bucket, you can have um, different versions. So you have like a sort of version control as well. So uh, the best way to use R and S3 buckets is to use the AWS S3 client package for R. So uh, it's provided by Cloud, Cloud R, um, the AWS.S3. It is a really simple package as an API wrapper for the S3 service. Uh, to use this package, you will need an AWS account and you'll need to create um, some credentials that you can enter into R uh, through a key pair, but it's very simple to use and S3 is a very low cost of service for basic use. Um, so that's why it's one of the easiest uh, barriers to entry to get to use. And then what we all know, I installed package. So AWS.S3. 
And then some very simple sample functions how to use a AWS S3 package. Um, there is a lot more creativity that you can use with this. But um, I mentioned earlier that you'll create some credentials that you can use to authenticate to your AWS account. And then you can grab a bucket that you've created. And then if you just want to save some in-memory R object to S3, uh, for example, that Titanic data set, you can do S3 save. You can write it to your bucket and you can give it a name. And then you can also load from your R session as well. So if you're working with data that you don't necessarily want to live in your R project or you don't want to commit data back to your GitHub repository, this is a really neat um, function as well. And then you can do a lot more um, than just using R data files. You can do CSV, Excel files, JPEGs from your, from your the outputs of your GG plots. So really neat functionality. Um, yeah, so I hopefully I didn't go too fast. I was trying to keep under uh, three minutes, uh, five minutes, but yeah. Hopefully it's a nice introduction and definitely recommend the GitHub repo of AWS.S3 if you want to look at more of the functionality of the package. Awesome. Um, next, we have Sinyu. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry. So I just want to make sure that I heard you in the room. Uh, or if the background music is a little bit too loud. Okay. So oh, let me share my screen. Uh, let me know if anybody can see the screen. Okay. So just a brief introduction about myself. My name is Lucy and I'm currently working in a bank in the like anti-financial crime uh, team to work with the data analysis and data uh, scientist work. So today the topic I want to talk about is about like how to balance the business and technical re uh, like requirements in our real uh, real world project because this is actually currently the question we actually need in the real life and just uh, like a little experience I want to share with everybody. So, like first, uh, this is like summarized the, the summarized by what we met in the real life and also like all the questions I summarized with all the past experiences. So basically, when we talk about a challenge about like technical perspective when we're meeting the business requirements. The first and the foremost we come for, like, we would like to say a challenge is about high deadlines. Because it is actually not a problem when we deal with a project in kind of the school, the university, or something like that. But when it comes to the real life, every deadline will make it as a milestone. And everybody, all the parties who encountered in this, uh, in this project will see that, okay, this is a time deadline for you. And you need to meet this, like, meet this one before by what? So this is the first and like real project, real problem I'm at in the project. And the second one I'm at in my project is uh, when we meet about the, like the objectives. Sometimes the objective when we set it and when it going to the real life is kind of different. So like sometimes we will meet a really big scope of what we talk about in the, like when we set about the objectives, then when it comes to the real life, like when we really do hands on on it, it seems kind of look a little bit different when we imagine what it could be. So that would be the second challenge where we as a technical team met. And the third is when it comes with the problem, like all of, all the problems we had and all the technical like challenges we met, the problem will come as the technical depth, uh, like depth, which means that it will become like another further problem when you maintain the same issues. Like it will like, cause the accumulation of the data when it comes to the problem. So how to deal with it, this challenge becomes a really interesting topic in our real life. And I would like to provide like two perspective methods to uh, like provide kind of solutions for this. The first becomes of the uh, like strategic methods and the second is the like kind of the technical methods. So for the strategic uh, methods, which is more about the communication, collaboration, and also like to uh, escalate to a manager and also to make make sure you make the smart prior, uh, prioritization and adaption. 
So first, let's come with a collaboration and communication. Just make sure that when you first come to this project, you engage as much, maybe not as much as, but as smart as the cross-functional teams to make sure you're aligned with your business requirements and also your technical, uh, like technical requirements. Uh, and also make sure that like always in the team, we always have the business perspective and also technical perspective, which might not speak the same language. So from your technical teams, make sure that one person could align both requirements and technical and always from the business teams, make sure that you have one person who is like real, has the technical background to uh, make sure that both requirements are aligned with each other. And the second one is like maintain uh, the opening channels of communication, like make sure that all, uh, you're communicating all the time and also to make sure everything are on the same page whenever like when it comes to the like a uh, real requirements or like different opinions from different teams. The second one I need to, I would like to uh, raise here is the prioritization and adaption. So like, especially when we meet the time deadline and also there will be like multiple, multiple tasks on our hands. Just to make sure with the multiple team and also the managers or the like the business requirements perspective, like what you're doing right now is what is apt to do, what must like what must to do, and what is to do and with the importance. For what could have done or what could be the like the future enhancements in the future. Maybe just not prioritize at this time and make it as a future plan. And also make sure the environment is like real safe for the product managers to uh, like give their opinions to give their opinions to support for the adaptions. Hi, can everybody hear me now? Okay, cool. So uh, where, where am I? So the last point I would like to express as for like the decision making. Try to make sure that every decision is made based on the data analysis and make sure that your data will support your decision to like make sure that uh, the technical skills, uh, like the technical perspectives is aligned with the business perspective. And the next part is of uh, uh, like a more like a technical method. What they put into the like a real uh like a real project, how to use your technical to make sure to meet the deadlines and also to make sure your project is ongoing in the same in the right path. So first it's about efficiency and adaptability. Sometimes when we deal with a large data or like a large data scope of the whole data set, we're all like like for me, I'm working in a bank, so I need to deal with the multiple months of the data. Make sure that uh, to like uh, escalate with your like higher level or manager to see that if we could focus in a smaller data scope, like if like initially we would like to uh, escalate it to maybe a monthly data or like a yearly data. Can we focus on the weekly or maybe just say even a day, like a few days to be uh, like accountable for this project? And the second one is to leverage for the cloud service. Sometimes like our time or our uh, like project net efficiency could be limited by the services or the server we have. So make sure that you have as much uh, resources from cloud services or just try to escalate to a manager and say that, okay, now we have limited resources. So we have much more like uh, maybe human resources or like the, uh, like the service we have to make sure everything works efficiently. The second one is about the security and the reliability. So sometimes when it comes to a tight deadline, the data might not be like we, we want things to get done. So we might engage uh, like multiple resources or matters. And sometimes we might not forget about like where we where we are just making stuff. So for this one, just try to make sure that all the data in deal with insecurity go and also try to keep on the right track, like for our functions, where are the users come from? Like what they want to do and how they want to do it. And just focus on where like you want the things get on the right path. And finally, it's about the problem or the challenge we talked about previously, it's about the depth management. So when it comes to the maintain, maintain or like when it comes to the uh, kind of a management or in the long-term run, what we're going to talk about is uh, like try to establish the automated pipelines 
to make sure that everything we do is not only just for ad hoc analysis, but also we want to make it as a uh, sustainable and auto automatic pipeline to make sure for the future assets. And the final one is that to ensure that this is a scalability planning just to make sure that it's not, not only on the end-to-end -end analysis, but also when we come to the... Yeah, sure. Okay, so basically that's the final point I would like to talk about. And that's it. Thank you so much. Um, next, we're going to switch to Ursula. Ursula, I believe you've been made co-host already. Thank you, Sydney, for sharing that. Hi, everybody. So I am going to give a brief introduction to convolutional neural nets. Uh, so by way of introduction, I am a data scientist at a civic tech org called Democracy Works. We make a suite of tools available to voters to remind them of when their elections are coming up, when their de uh, deadlines for registration are coming up, so on and so forth. So as many of us know, uh, neural nets are a key uh, step in helping computers uh, recognize objects in images. And so we see this technology used in autonomous vehicles, and we see it used in some applications like detecting wildfires or conversion of handwritten forms to digital, like character recognition, and distinguishing between benign and malignant tumors. And so I just wanted to give a quick introduction as to how convolutional neural nets work. So the idea is that a convolutional neural net dissects an image's patterns by extracting the features uh, from the image, which is the base part of the model, and then classifies that image based on the features that the model detects. And so the feature extraction takes place through filtering. The next step is then detecting the features within the filtered image, and lastly, condensing the image to enhance those features. So filtering recognizes that behind each image, we have a set of structured numbers, pretty much a matrix. And the model has a sort of uh, lens, a sort of polarized lens that scans over the image, the image's pixels to produce a weighted sum of pixel values. This emphasizes or de-emphasizes uh, certain patterns within that image. And so we have kernels that find horizontals, kernels that find verticals, kernels that find diagonals, so on and so forth. And so the convolution is that scan, is that iteration over the pixels in the model. Uh, the next Next step is feature extraction uh, in feature extraction is detection, which scores those pixel values, uh, the sum of the weights and the pixel values according to some measure of importance. And so, so for example, negative values that aren't important, the model sets them to zero. Everything that is unimportant is equally unimportant. And then the last step is condensation, where we get rid of all of that equally unimportant stuff, all of those zeros. And we condense the feature map to retain only the most useful parts, which is the feature itself. Otherwise, we have a model that is adding um, a lot of size without much useful information. And so I want to do a quick demonstration of an actual model in Kaggle, where we try to distinguish pictures of bagels from pictures of puppies. So uh, this will be done in Python. So with all due respect to our ladies, uh, I already had this notebook written in Python. It didn't have a chance to transpose it into R. Uh, so we're using uh, primarily TensorFlow functions and packages. We're gonna run 20 epics. We have a very small training and test set and I'll make those uh, sets available uh, through a GitHub repo. Uh, so some of our, uh, our hyperparameters, so we don't necessarily want the model to learn too fast. So we're gonna kind of ramp up the learning rate and then uh, hold it there, let it plateau for a bit, and then let it fall uh, ever so slightly. So uh, as you can see, we have a pretty small file set. Um, and what we're going to do is look at 
Yeah, puppies and bagels. Okay, so uh, let's split into training and validation. Let's load the model itself. So we're using a pre-trained model, uh, the uh, exception. So we're going to be engaging in transfer learning, the pre-trained uh, base used for, for other tasks. And then let's run our model really quickly. This is GPU enabled, so it should go through it pretty quickly. And uh, then we can display our model loss and accuracy curves. So we do want to see some kind of correspondence between an increase in our training set accuracy and in our validation accuracy. Otherwise, if we're seeing a gap emerge between training and validation, we're likely seeing some model overfitting. And as you can see with GPU, it runs through these epochs really quickly. And with the basic model, with such a small data set, yeah, we're seeing a lot of noise. The model is picking up on a lot of the idiosyncrasies within those uh, within those pictures. So what do we do? A common, a common practice is to run through a set of data aug augmentation where we add additional images, uh, synthetic images, by transforming images within our training set by zooming in on them, by stretching them out, by turning them around, by rotating them, and if we run the, if we run the training, uh, if we run the model over the training again, we should hopefully see a reduction in the difference between the training validation, uh, between the training accuracy and the validation accuracy, and also a decrease in our model loss for the validation set as well. And so, just looking at this really quickly, we are seeing a bit. A closer correspondence between the training and the validation accuracy. And if we display those curves, we should see, yeah, a little better. It's a little tighter, still not quite the same, but you know, we had nearly perfect uh, training set accuracy the first time around, which is a clear sign of overfitting. So we save our model, we make a new set of predictions on the test set, which is a pretty small test set. And let's see, uh, lastly, some of the stuff we got right and some of the stuff we got, we got wrong. So here we're seeing some pretty high confidence levels with the exception of this bagel here. My guess is the seeds contribute to that. And uh, some of the wrong ones, we're seeing some fairly high confidence levels too, in which case a great way to deal with that is to penalize the model for not uh, correctly guessing. So thanks so much for your attention. I'll post a link to this information in the GitHub repo uh, within the chat. Present here, and I'm very excited for this. I have kind of a lot of content. Uh, I will just start my timer on my phone, but before that, let me just try to share my screen. So let me know if you guys could see my screen. Let me just show you. Kind of maximize the participants. So, uh, the topic that I want to present today on is how to supercharge your R shiny or R projects development workflow. So since you know, a lot of cool projects everybody has been working on, there are a lot of nifty things that you might not done on the job. And uh, every developer's journey is kind of different when you start working and when you start collaborating. So uh, here's something a little bit about me. I have been working in R space and R shiny for the last six years. I have kind of architected and built more than R shiny projects from ground up where you know, I've also created ecosystems of projects to interact with each other. And you know, uh, all of these are apps are either enterprise applications or dashboards, uh, which would handle uh, you know a few hundreds of users at the same time and let them kind of automate their data science workflow in pharma or insurance. Uh, I have I've also been a trainer trainer. Uh, you no, know, I have kind of trained 10 developers and uh, got them into my teams and uh, you know given quarterly trainings to more than 30 people over a year uh, and i do like to dabble in all the uh, flavors of our whatever we come so core to arm up down you know package down so that is something about me uh, all this is driven by you know uh, my curiosity to learn and right now i'm in a senior uh, r consultant uh, with procogia which is a data consulting firm 
uh, at, with HQ in Canada and offices in uh, New York, uh, Ireland, India. And you know, uh, we are one of the partner for public. So for this talk, uh, it's gonna be very fast. It's I'm gonna just touch base on the following four points, which I personally feel could help you in any of your R projects to speed up your flow and you know to kind of manage your technical debt. So first thing is how you do, how do you streamline your workflows, and then how do you what are these tips in Shiny that would help you to debug faster or to develop faster? Then what are some of the productivity ha productivity hacks for any R project? And then some of the R shortcuts from your R Studio ID, uh, given that you that would be your favorite ID to work for. R. You could obviously use VS Code, but then the VS Code shortcuts are different than ID R Studio ID. So yeah, those do also have a lot of shortcuts. So first and foremost, when how do you streamline your workflow? Uh, there are kind of four things that you could do to start off as a basic. You could uh, you should always use R Studio projects, uh, and the reason is you know it would kind of contain your project and kind of set your relative path with everything. So your development environment would be kind of always pointing in the right file path, uh, which sometimes we kind of forget when we want to quickly work on a new R script or you know any new quick analysis, we would just open up a new script and start working. Second is to use a standard uh, project structure. So it could be either you can use a template or you can you know adopt somebody's template so that all your files go into the specific folders. And you know that way if you're working on larger projects or you have, if you have more colleagues to kind of collaborate with, uh, it the standardization will help for you know easier uh, onboarding and you know faster development. Uh, then you should also use package management tools for you know reproducibility. Uh, you could either use RENV or Packeret. Packeret has been there for quite some years now. Uh, uh, the key difference between RENV and Packeret is uh, Packeret shows the binaries in your local, whereas RENV just just shows the link and the you know source repo from. So RNV is the latest one, which I absolutely recommend. And it's very easy to you know, start going with it. Just five minutes of reading and then you are kind of future proof. And the last, but not the least, is obviously version control because it helps you to see where your code is, uh, you know, what flow it has gone through. And then you can easily share it with your team members and you can track things on them. So just a quick slide on how to kind of create a new RStudio product. Uh, you could go to file new project and then there's a new directory option there where you can either choose a new version control or if you're working on local you just you know use a new directory option and then create it from there uh, and then uh, here's a snapshot of a uh, project structure that i personally like to use in all my and enterprise or personal shiny development wherein any R, R file that i have it, it could be a shiny ui or server it could be a module or it could be a function or it could be utility functions which consist of multiple functions so any file uh, which kind of helps my project or my shiny uh, with an R extension would go into this folder, uh, R folder. And then the code would have all the additional codes that you would need. Let's say the, uh, you know, you could inject R markdowns into specific pages so that you just write text and then it renders as an HTML. Or you could have a Python script if you're using a reticulate. Or you could just have .md script for GitHub or whatever, you know, uh, collaboration you are doing. So this is where all my code uh, other than R goes into so that I always know if this file is being referenced, it would be in code. And then you might also have a folder called data where you would be using some dummy data or you would be using the first iteration of the data that you're building your R project with. So it's always good to put it into data builder so you know immediately where your data is always there. Uh, I kind of use the structure of global.r, ui.r, and server.r for shiny developments. So these are the three files that you see in my uh, root directory. And then references, uh, basically any research that I did for that application, the links for that would go there so that I could come back and you know uh, have those there but then the key is to not over you know throw everything there just the key links for your research that you I might have picked up poc from there and, and kind of extended and triple w folder basically uh, to put any html css or custom javascript that you might have or any svg files so everything goes there so we, this is a combination of kind of uh, a web development and uh, you know enterprise application so that it becomes easier to start with so a few of the tips for shiny development uh, is you always optimize your server logic. Uh, if your application is slow to load or if your application gets stuck in any process, uh, you know, you always try to go back to the code that is running that code. And then you try to profile it using profits or, you know, uh, kind of benchmark it. So you would understand the bottleneck lines and then you try to make it efficient or, you know, apply a different logic to make it faster. Uh, next one is to use coding principles for general programming language. Uh, there are a lot of things that people use. Uh, using even one or two would make, you know, will give you a significant boost. So don't repeat yourself, which is basically if you write a code more than once, you immediately, you know, make it a function. The function doesn't have to be, you know, as 
a pro it could be a simple function but then it would any change you would not need to make, make in that function you could only make it once and it would be affected everywhere and then again is sometimes we develop features that we would think that you know this the user might need or the business might need so there we kind of delay our projects to uh, push them so you know don't overthink it just you know keep it simple uh, which is kind of ties to the next uh, tip and then document your code for humans and you know it should be clean at all costs you should not wait for it to come back after a week and document it or clean it and then you know keep it for later so the best way to document your code is always at that point it might take you some little more more time but it will help you in the long run and then yeah, sorry that. the next one is to always use a reactive program uh, there could be multiple models of reactivity uh, you could take inspiration from nature so one of the inspiration that i have taken is to use a waterfall reactivity model which is basically you know if you have larger apps you cannot kind of have a spaghetti reactivity mesh which is basically your reactivity is firing up from all directions when you click a button and then you, you don't know what is going on right it just works and if something comes up you are like you know at the mercy of god so waterfall model kind of uh, makes sure one reactive reactivity will trigger the next one and then it will trigger the next one and then there's a flow so you will always know where your code is getting triggered and what is going on uh, another one is to implement efficient components for the ui uh, i generally use draw.io which is a great open source tool to kind of show it to your clients and stakeholders what kind of application you would build or what you are thinking so uh, uh, having a visual imagery is very easy to get the confirmation and then kind of start working towards instead of showing five six different you know iterations and you know working hard and the key is to iterate as soon as possible probably you know every two days there's a discussion just you know iterate it rapidly show them get the approval and then start coding and you know start developing your application uh, next moving on to some of the productivity hacks uh, oh, yeah. Right. So just I'll complete it in 30 minutes. Thank you. So productivity hacks is, uh, you know, we need to learn uh, how to debug in an R studio using browser or debug functions. Uh, you should automate your repetitive tasks like testing or deployment. And then the last and not the least is, you know, uh, probably give some time to uh, understand the shortcuts that are inbuilt in R studio ID. This will significantly, significantly boost your workflow. You know, things like creating a newspaper, running your code. So the cheat sheet is actually there in iStudio ID. If you go to tools, keyboard shortcut helps, add it is highlighted here. Uh, you will see an entire pane. And uh, so this is all about my top. Uh, the pages, the code is available at GitHub, which I will share. And then uh, there's an appendix which you could go over, which has some of my you know favorite uh, shortcuts that I use in my workflow. So you know, give it a try, and then uh, you know, I hopefully you will like it. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for our speakers um, and presenters today. Um, would love to invite this time when anyone have questions for a specific speaker, um, feel free to hop off mute. Um, I'm actually gonna pause the recording if it does hasn't stopped itself and um, you guys can feel free to ask some questions for the time that we have.